as you know, this is, uh, we've had a series of guest talks over the last few weeks. A number of them have been alumni and I've really appreciated uh, hearing from them. But then um, again, I'm, I'm already putting Julia into the alumni camp. So when I get, when I hear <laughs> about, uh, a speaker that could be inspiring, has something um, very interesting to share, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to those opportunities, introduce new people into the greater CDM mix. So um, Liliana came highly recommended by Julie. I'm not trying to set, set this up for anything more than what it's <laughs> be, but I do want to provide the real honor of introducing Liliana to Julia. So Julia, I say my thanks to you for having brought this um, talk to life. And, and uh, let's run with it because again, we only have 50 minutes to play with here. Uh, we hopefully yep. will have some time for Q&A at the end and uh, you'll have a chance to, to check out the project if I talk short. So. Julia, if you wouldn't mind. Yes, of course. So um, for those who don't know me, I am a, uh, a creative from C14. And I recently visited the Sigur of Computer Graphics and Animation Conference, where, um, as you know, Larry is the VR theater director there. It's a two week conference, huge variety of content uh, from a global community of creators. It has lots of like gaming, animation, new technology, art and science stuff. Um, they have some pretty awesome special sessions in between that are exploring like hot topics that are impacting the creative industry. And in one of these sessions uh, was the digital arts community exhibition that was called Digital Power, Activism, Advocacy and the Influence of Women Online. So I was like, yes, I am watching that. <laughs> and that is where I first saw Liliana speak. Uh, Liliana is an assistant professor of communication studies at the California State University in San Bernardino, which is close to LA. I googled it because I didn't know where that was. Um, the things I read about Liliana were she is an uncivil disruptor who doesn't know her place. She challenges the norm of professors and she uses humor as a power source. So I thought that sounds awesome. And what I actually saw when I watched the SIGGRAPH presentation was a combination of an intriguing process in creating art in VR, uh, which was presented with passion, eloquence, and occasional expletives, which was different to everyone else speaking. I was like, I like this, <laughs> this speaks to me. So I reached out to her after the conference to see whether she would talk to us and she said, yes. So. Liliana, please take it away. <laughs> Thank you very much. You know, and I want to express my gratitude for this invitation to the Center for Digital Media and its four partner institutions like University of British Columbia, Simon Fraser University, British Columbia Institute of Technology, and the Emily Carr uh, University of Art and Design, and particularly to uh, Director Dennis Chenard, who's here, and to Julia Reed who has made this all possible. And I also wanna thank all of you in attendance uh, for your interest in sharing this moment with me today. Um, I would also like to take a moment to acknowledge uh, the Costa Salish people whose territories the CDM now benefits from and acknowledge that we at California State University San Bernardino have benefited, benefited and continue to benefit um, from the use and occupation of the indigenous homelands of the Serrano Yuhabiatan people, also known as the San Manuel Band of Mission Indians. And with this land acknowledgement, we affirm indigenous sovereignty and will work to hold all, institutionals, all, all institutions accountable uh, to the needs of all indigenous peoples and also to the return of these lands. Um, I am an associate professor uh, at a so-called Hispanic serving institution. Uh, but there's still a lot of work which needs to be done, especially in the realm of helping faculty understand what this actually means. Uh, for many years, assimilation has been perpetuated as a prerequisite for uh, the opportunity of reaching success. And land has an undying memory, right? And we indigenous mestizos and the indigenous people of the Americas, uh, we belong to these lands uh, just in the way we are, right? And under such circumstances, uh, the continuous envisioning of higher education as a type of boarding school uh, leads to what we erroneously call achievement gaps, putting the responsibility on students 
we, when we are supposed, the ones that we're supposed to serve. Um, another result is that we hear a framing that not, not enough women and BIPOC want to study STEM. And it's not that we don't want to, right? Uh, the reason I can tell you from my own experience as a student was that there have been enormous pedagogical, cultural, and many other identity-based gaps, right? And the way these classes were taught, even with an aesthetic derived from a cult of Eurocentric modernity of order and progress, made me feel unwelcome, as if it were not something for me, right? I felt like the bean and the rice. I don't know if you've ever heard of that phrase. Uh, but I stuck out, you know, and even to the extreme of feeling that science, technology, engineering, and mathematics were something that existed to delete me. So not only was it like I was not <laughs> included, it was like it existed again against me. So I did not know if for a fact then, but I was not wrong, right? As it has been demonstrated that science, in fact, was used to justify the invention of race and racism through pseudoscientific practices such as phrenology and the farce of social Darwinism. Technology was also used this way as a justification for genocide and the obliteration of indigenous people. For example, during the turn of the 20th century, when Mexico was trying to define itself as a nation that we know today under the dictatorship of Porfirio Diaz, a man who was obsessed with turning uh, Mexico into a second France. Uh, indigenous peoples, especially the Mayo and the Yaqui, were attacked and murdered for the purposes of expanding civilization, right? And building a railroad track that would connect the Pacific and the Atlantic Oceans. And indigenous land and people were stolen and exploited with the justification that they were not being used or put to work at the levels possible when we're making use of the most current technology. So this is when diverse and multiple indigenous cultures, peoples, languages, music, science, mathematics, and multiple cosmovisions were made to seem to be part of a past and thus they should pass, right? Until this day, there are still people living and breathing who believe that indigenous people are in the past, that they're not still here with us today. Um, in fact, some people who are indigenous don't even know they are indigenous. And this is due to other impositions, right? For example, there was a very strong caste system in Mexico, which at one point had more than 100 different castes. And those in the higher castes were Christians, which was a code word for white Europeans. And they could take advantage of belonging to higher castes in the form of financial opportunities, access to education, and having to actually pay less taxes than those in the lower castes, the indigenous and African descendants. So when people had children that could pass as white, uh, they went and asked for those in the higher castes if they could please act as godparents to their children and tell the church that their child was of a higher caste because the designations were given out by the church uh, in baptismal records. So as you can imagine, people were forced to deny who they were in the hopes of attaining regular opportunities in life. Um, I tell you this, all this, to give you an idea of where I come from, like where I'm coming from, right? Uh, I just gave you a few examples of what makes me see things differently, uh, here particularly in terms of STEAM and STEM and education. So we're dealing with generations of being told that we do not belong and that if we want to belong, we must assimilate to a culture and institutions which have a way of seeing the world that goes directly against our own existence. And this resistance exists within multiple dimensions, both consciously and unconsciously, because our way of understanding the world and all that exists within it, invisible and visible, is limited by the civilization that we grow up in and its ideology. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a, a little virtual background video for you guys as I, I speak the, uh, the rest of my talk. So there are things we know without knowing we know them. Right? It is possible to understand something in our bodies without cognitively putting into words how it is we understand it. So it is no coincidence that some ways of knowing have been also hierarch hierarchized by and presented as cognitive ways of, of knowing which have been associated with humans and white men, right, and white cultures. And then, for example, bodily ways of knowing which have been associated with animals women and non-white cultures. Uh, these divisions are telling you that they are mistaken in the mere fact that they are binaries, right? And the binary is an oversimplification of all that is truly complex. 
And always please be wary of anything based on binary logic, right? Uh, art is a process that allows us to experience the complexities of knowing, of understanding, comprehending, interpreting, realizing, seeing, etc. because there's many ways of knowing, right? So I knew about STEAM, right? And how incorporating art could help introduce more women to STEM and people of color, right? And the importance of art as technique was great, yet less attention was being given to culture and to memory. So I began to use culture in, and memory in both content and format to create a design for culturally formatted introductory programs to STEM. So we begin to reclaim STEM intersectionally through its own relation to marginalized knowledges and my, minoritized identities. Uh, by introducing students to the art of turning the learning of experimental production and other art forms into a culturally relevant endeavor using virtual reality, I can get them to see coding in a different way, start designing 3D objects with the personal purpose of resistance and liberation, and enter these career paths from this other angle. Uh, my courses began producing uh, such experimental pieces and coordinating independent events to showcase them where the community also took part. And the events were significantly successful because participation in such events is very rare for a commuter school such as ours where most of our students are sole providers for their families and they must juggle with multiple responsibilities right so in seeing this change in interest and participation the university began to fully support these types of events and one of these events was called uh, the Art of Dreaming, which was a community-centered interactive research-based production performance. And it is a series composed of the design, curation, and presentation of four linked yet separate performances uh, or public displays. So students and local artists were called to produce art around the topic of being undocumented, right? And then spoken word artists came forward, sculptures and musicians were also invited. Uh, and the activities supporting all events were incorporated into my experimental media production courses. So the students were in charge of the PR and the marketing campaigns, the logistics of the events, as well as the production of experimental documentary and news media videos, radio podcasts on the event itself. Um, so we had also local media, we invited local media to the events. So the final event was a silent auction of all the multimedia pieces that were created during the previous events while we were repurposing trash uh, generated by the university. Uh, so the Art of Dreaming collected over $5,000, then we donated those to the Undocumented Student Success Center for Emergency Fund Scholarships. So students knowing this, of course, that they were interested, knowing that it was going to have a direct impact, and they were also learning how to use um, media and produce media in the process. Uh, another example was our San Bernardino Nuestro, which is a, show, a showcase, again, curated by myself in collaboration with my PR students. And those who attended would enter a room and experience a, a VR series. There were a bunch of 360 videos that were produced by my experimental media production students on the diversity that is publicly seen around campus. And in just a position, we had a wall screening video collages produced by my decolonizing Chicano Latino media class in which they related their personal and private experiences with the logic of coloniality and discrimination in education, right? So you entered a, a dystopic uh, space, right? A, a border space. So all of my experimental media and technology exhibitions are complex and they involve multiple actors and the community is the heart of my um, pieces. Um, what you see in the Koyoshauki Imperative 2020, which is what we'll share with you today, it's, it's a VR video where you can enter uh, my unconscious mind and experience the Chicana Indígena Transborder Mestiza Unconsciousness, a magical realist resistance, uh, which is a representation of a hack on transgenerational memory and culture resisting against the binary and oversimplistic ideology of coloniality. Uh, please keep in mind that while we're screening this in 2D today, uh, the piece was designed to be experienced in virtual reality. Uh, I wanted to portray the format that gives my experimental production uh, the consciousness and unconsciousness that inhabits the Chicana Transfronteriza imaginary, one that cannot see the future without linking it to the past. Right, one that exists in spite of all the violence and maybe because of all the violence as well. Um, the Koyoshauki Imperative 2020 
is a 3D space of immersive neo-muralism, which I built with a combination of both 2D and 3D components uh, from three main sources. Uh, one, uh, we're gonna see excerpts from ancient Mexican indigenous codices, which announced the arrival of calamity, which we later learned was the invasion, rape, and destruction of these lands and colonization. Uh, two, there's codices that are positioned in conversation with excerpts from Mexican muralism of Diego Rivera, uh, Diego Alba Alfaro Siqueiros and Jose Clemente Orozco, which were painted during a time when Mexicanidad or Mexicanity was being reinvented as Mexican epistemology and education were controlled by Eurocentric visions of what we should be or should want to be. And finally, I include, well, no, not finally, three and four. So I include pieces of my own artwork and paintings in which I tell the effects of ideological and psychological marginalization brought by the ignorance of those who are in charge right now. And I use my personal experiences as an example because I'm critical of being positioned as a brown woman first, a Chicana whose existence in a male-centered, white-centric space such as academia is always drenched with multiple forms of violence. Uh, in these spaces, I'm expected to fly low, be professional, which is code for acting and thinking like a white man, right, and navigate in a fragmentary way where I do not claim my right to exist equally and openly, um, where when I'm refusing now to walk on eggshells, right, my power and the value of my input, which would help these institutions grow and develop further, is seen as a threat or uncivil, and even worse, as unimportant. Right? So there are people who continuously attempt to punish me for being who I am. And I can tell you candidly that this is happening to me now as I speak here uh, to you. This is, I'm going through that kind of stuff, right? So finally, there's my voice. And you're going to see my voice also parallels many voices, right? And hopefully, hopefully it speaks. Uh, and uh, in a way that, you know, reaches uh, another dimension of your understanding, right? Um, and you're going to see a piece of spoken word in Spanish, English, and Nahuatl. And Nahuatl was the language of the Aztecs, also known as Mexica. So these four sources all have something in common, right? The recurring storytelling, which is decolonial or anti-colonial of the mythopoetic experience of the weeping woman. You're going to find the weeping woman in all these elements. In the indigenous codices, she is Siwakoatl. In the muralist, she's La Malinche and La Llorona. And in my artwork, she's La Chingada, or a woman who suffers openly and out loud, who reclaims and demands for amends to be made, who resists being fucked over recurrently, right? Generationally, by the existence of hierarchical oppression at a macro historical and public level in the context of the American continent in relation to European colonialism, U.S. imperialism, and neoliberalism in globalization, and the persistence of pyramid-shaped ideology at the micro, contemporary, and private levels in the context of having your perspective invalidated, made invisible, your identity be othered, your kin be murdered, incarcerated, and your health destroyed, and your well-being neglected as the ill treatment of people of color in healthcare has been demonstrated uh, academically. So to counteract all this bullshit that we live in on the daily, uh, I created this VR space and in, then went in with a camera and made a 2D short film that brings forth the intergenerational power of Chicana feminism, its roots beyond the trauma of colonization into indigenous Mexica Tenochtitlan mythology, also known as Aztec. And in this world, you find an effort to immerse the user in what is theoretically proposed by queer Chicana philosopher and thinker, Gloria Evangelina Ansaldúa, the Chicana border mestiza unconscious, which is the genius mind of the imagination for all those macro and micro realities that exist in constant tension within a single being and between each other may coexist and interact. Uh, the fragmentary parts of our history and of our identity, some imposed by settler colonial and patriarchal perspectives, while some by our resistance, can be weaponized, druid-like powers of a shape-shifting quality with the power to be assembled and reassembled in whichever way is necessary, depending of the point in time in history and the needs. Uh, so the power of the digital for me is the ability to open vortices of multiple dimensions that commingle within an immersive experience that we have been living for over 500 years and beyond that, right, in the Americas. So it is a window to the consciousness, to conocimiento 
our forbidden knowledge and our forbidden selves into memory and the sensibility and imaginary of the Chicanx indigena mestiza from the border. And I'm working now on a lesson plan to teach students how to produce pieces like this and push forward the creation of a VR lab for such a task uh, at Cal State San Bernardino. And it is healing to recover our agency by reconstructing and reframing our histories in experimental ways that incite the imagination and invite users to explore and put the pieces together in new ways, right? Ways that I, as designer and producer of this piece, for example, could not have even imagined. Um, and there is no resolution, just the process of healing through an audiovisual experience. Uh, the level of healing does depend on the knowledge that the user has of the images and symbols visuals represented here behind me, uh, or whatever it is that you might want, might want to include in your piece. So this knowledge needs not to be cognitive, right? As spiritual knowledge is evoked by the immersive nature of the experience. So if you feel left out today, it is fulfilling its other purpose. Welcome to my world, welcome to our world, right? So um, that's all I have, thank you. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> that was amazing. Honestly, I mean, did you even breathe? Thank you. I have <laughs> asthma. I, so, <laughs> I don't know. I'm not sure. <laughs> wow. I'm guilty. On yeah. of information. Fantastic. Thank you. I want a water. I feel like I, I want to get you a water, but I can't. <laughs> I have water and tea here. I just was like worried that you guys don't have any. I felt bad. <laughs> All right. But we're going to show the video the now. Experience. Thank you. Obliged to resist. In their footsteps, cruzamos las fronteras de letras y papeles. Today, as glorias maquiladoras, guadalupes y chingadas, nepantleras, dwellers of the in-between. Yesterday, as las lloronas, malinches y marinas, artists formerly known as Sihuacoat, mucho antes, Cuatlicue, La Solteotol, Mayahuel, Chalchicuitle, Coyol Shauki. Donantzin. Ipanemo wani no yolo tatsin, la soca mati donantzin. You are the giver of life. We have your venerable heart. Thank you, Earth Mother. Perpetually, as maestras del sacrificio escondido y silencioso, the entire universe flows from our mouths with roots in the concealed beyond. We glimpse at our glorious histories entre las flores y magueyes between certainty and fabrication, framing and reframing a heritage of traumas with thorns and needles, the weaponized bones of the innocent and of children for whom the cost of fractured history is life itself. Hijitos míos, pues ya tenemos que irnos lejos. Hijitos míos, ¿a dónde os llevaré? Oh, my little children, now we must go far away. Oh, my little children, where shall I take you? Healing wounds through past 
paths of creative impulse, we enter battles of birth giving. While capturing life spirit, damos la vida misma. As fallen warriors, the sorrows of our spirits, of those of our fallen children, embellish the dangerousness of our power as we live on as butterflies. In this battle path to conocimiento, forgetting is no option. When we are continuously torn apart, made invisible, made to fear, y sin embargo, ahí está siempre llorona. There you are always, llorona. If I have given you life itself, Yorona, what else do you want? You want more. When we penetrate inside our deepest within, into the pounding, fibrous womb of our conciencias. Our collective conocimiento speaks, florece. These paths, these the paths, ones we call vida, the ones we call vida, are not our own, are not our own, are not our own. We recover pieces rearrange them. Amongst the smoke, hidden relations are revealed. These visual languages speak to us from within and beyond ourselves. Somehow, we already know these ways. We are inviting you to speak. If you always speak, we are inviting you to be silent and listen. These caminos are tilled by layered footsteps, by the eclipsed ancestral memories of our relations, whose precious knowledge invented ways to survive the great floods of patriarchal supremacist arrogance and endure the prolonged blazes of coloniality. These ways were lovingly sown by those who raised us while we were forbidden to learn their names. of El Maguey, conocimiento endemic to our lands, humbly feeding, clothing, sheltering, soothing from coloniality, the ways of our gente whose sharp-toothed voices burst through so-called traditional books with genius everlasting in harvests of colors, sounds, and spirits, whose resilience is written instead upon each of our faces, the Maguey, you see, the Nopal, just because you cannot see, it does not mean they aren't there. You must, you must shift, you must shift.
Uh, thank you. I also want to uh, give credit to Juan Carlos Portillo, who was the person that played the Teponastli, and also uh, Corey McCormick uh, from Man in the Bottle, who played the minimalist uh, music that you hear in the background. Thank you. Thank you very much. If anyone has any questions, I have a few to please go ahead and ask. I can start. <laughs> um, what is the, the green and red plant that keeps appearing in the scenery? Is that the agave? Yes. Yes, that's I, the agave. Agave, sorry. Yes, I remember you mentioning its, its healing property. So it has quite a, a, like a bit of symbolism in the culture. Oh, the, maguey, uh, the maguey clothes us. The maguey, uh, we used it to uh, put it on top of the houses, right? Yeah. For, to cover techo. Uh, also for medicine, right? For medicina. Um, the maguey has curative powers and it's also endemic to Mexico, right? So it's uh, from these lands, right? Mm -hmm. And it's and it survives in very extreme um, circumstances, right? Mm -hmm. extreme, uh, so I believe it represents a path or a way of life of resistance um, that it represents indigenous resistance and, in, and it represents also mestizo, indigenous mestizo resistance because uh, Latinos are usually, this, this is a bag, right, term where you're putting people from two different continents. I mean, from where some Latinos are from North America and the Caribbean and Central America. Other Latinos are from South America. <laughs> so we're putting all Latinos in one bag to begin with. And I'm saying not even Mexicans can all fit in the same bag, right? Because uh, even me, I'm Mexican, but I am an, I am an indigenous mestiza from the border very different from maybe a white European Mexican. We have those two, or a black Mexican, right? Or, a, or someone that is also mestizo, but tends to be more Spanish. We have a lot of the people like this, for example, in New Mexico, right? Um, so there's this diversity of identities that we have, even in, in these you know, nation states, they're, they're made up, right? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, if you look at a map of Europe, for example, uh, you see Spain and you see France and they're all little tiny, you know, tiny little nations. Well, in Americas, we also had a lot of nations, like tiny little nations, millions, thousands of them, sorry. So, you know, with millions of people. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Thanks. I want to see who's a couple of people have raised a hand. Um, I'm not entirely sure how to continue. I haven't actually hosted a session like that before. Um, can I just ask for um, Inda to ask her question first? Yes. Inda, yeah. um, hi, not a question. I just wanted to thank you for sharing such a powerful project. I am also a Mexican fronteriza woman. I am from Ciudad Juarez, so I was very moved, almost moved to tears in some parts. And um, yeah, it made me think of like how the only connection to our indigenous culture that I know of that I have is my name. Like my name, Inda, is from Zapotec culture and it means water. And that's basically the only thing that remains from our culture that I know of, that I have a close connection with. And yeah, I just wanted to ask, uh, where are you from, from the border? I'm from Tijuana. Okay. Escuela from the sister city. <laughs> Thank you so That's much awesome. for your comment. Thank you. Thank and you, you know, I, I'm also trying to, uh, with, with the, this piece, I hope you can see, I mean, you need to know, understand a lot of the symbolism as well, right? Um, but um, I'm trying to create a parallelism between the experiences of women, not only through like borders, like us, us we have parallel lives, you know, in the sense of experiencing being from the border and also living in a different place, right? Um, but also the experiences that we share transgenerationally, right? 
like the loss of land, the loss of language, the loss of culture, because we're being put through violence, right, through colonization. And then again, when the United States, when, when, when Spain comes and colonizes and then try to create a nation state by mestizos who were privileging Eurocentric ideals, right, and they're trying to eliminate once again our indigenous culture more and more, right? So then Face that, then face Americans, right? The Anglo European, the Anglo uh, centered American empire coming into, you know, Mexico because Mexico was uh, first before the United States. The United States, they, the settlers came westward bound and took over, right? Uh, they would say that they won, <laughs> but, you know, it was really that they sold it to someone that was corrupt, right? So, then we we were stolen that whole side of us was stolen it became the united states and then that and then later we have the united states coming to the latin american countries and making it unlivable we can't survive in our own countries because all the natural resources are being sucked out so then you start to see an influx of immigrants coming from all over latin america and women losing their children right in the process we see children and women being separated from each other right and it reminds me of La Malinche, right? When she's forced to be separated from her children, right? Or how we are maybe separated from her children due to health reasons, due to being overworked, due to being uh, uh, suffering constant violence in the workplace. It makes you unhealthy, you know? I have friends who have uh, heart problems, right? People who work in academia who are women of color, they have health issues very soon when they're not supposed to because they're so constantly like dealing with these different types of violence. So like, I'm hoping to show that that parallels exist and continue. This oppression is continuous. It hasn't really gone, you know, this uh, post-racial life doesn't exist. <laughs> you know, it's just a revamp, continuous revamp, revamp. Um, if I could ask uh, Valentina yeah. to speak no, Thank next. you, thank you so much. Thank you. In the Hello. Um, yeah, thank you so much for sharing. Um, it was incredibly powerful, like so powerful that I'm afraid I'm just going to kind of ramble instead of uh, forming my question well. Um, but I guess something like an impression that I got from your work is that it's this really interesting, um, it kind of feels almost like a virtual reality essay. Um, because there's your own voice and perspective and interpretation and there's these references to um, other art and kind of important like historical icons that are almost like the footnotes or the the references in your work. And so um, in some of my experience with academia and maybe a little bit of my interpretation of it, it feels like sometimes there's this kind of pressure to either pick like I am a art practicer or I am an art researcher um, and I was wondering how you kind of deal with being kind of at the intersection of those two things. Well it's gonna sound uh, kind of bad but I do whatever the fuck I want you know <laughs> like you gotta do what you do like look, look when you do like look what I did, you know, because I did what I wanted. Like if I had followed the rules of like what art should look like or like the minimalist aesthetics of technology, like, you know, all that stuff they throw at you like and and like it shouldn't be art. Art should be something that everyone just understands. And it's kind of like you shouldn't include like, you know, things that will attack others or others will feel attacked by them. And it's just like, well, isn't that what art should be to begin with, right? Art should be questioning itself constantly, right? But then people who are teaching it are telling you not to do that, right? Um, and, you know, I, I take a lot of inspiration also from uh, indigenous, you know, indigenous culture and teaching uh, the way that uh, teaching was done and, and is continued to be done in indigenous uh, uh, communities is through practice, right? Uh, what we call today like innovative, like um, what do they call it? Precipitary action research and all these different like, you know, uh, labels that they have of uh, experiential learning. Um, you know, I, I understand that a lot of that is appropriation from actually the boarding schools that I was mentioning earlier, uh, when uh, Europeans were trying to make indigenous people into Europeans and turn them and cut their hair and everything. Uh, they took 
from the way that indigenous people learn to then br brainwash them into then thinking, you know what I mean? Like white people or believing in the Eurocentric vision or even the epistemology, the kind of books you read, the kind of information you learn. Um, so anyway, indigenous people used when the Spaniards went to Mexico and they first saw, they're like, whoa, look at, there's more books here than we've ever seen before. There were more books that they ever had seen anywhere else in the world than at that moment. And they saw that they were visual, visual books, right? They had pictograph, pictographs. It's kind of like our cell phones now. If you look at your icons in your phone, if you show that to someone from 30 years ago, they would be like, what the heck? What is this white bird in this blue square, right? <laughs> but we all know what that is. Like, we don't even have to say Twitter, right? Like, I can just show you the image and we immediately know what that means. So this is how people were communicating back then, 500 years, even before that, right? Before we came and disrupted that, that continuity, right? Like that continuity of that. Um, so when he came, he also found out not only did they have books, they had music too. And history was remembered in song form. Think about like how many songs you know, right? And you can actually like sing the lyrics with the artist. There's probably hundreds of songs. Like I know a bunch of songs, right? And I know the lyrics and I sing. So like, you know, this is, it makes sense that you would then keep history in a musical format, right? And that this is why, again, it, 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 the elders are venerated and loved and taken care of because the elders were history. They were the keepers of the knowledge of the history that would be passed on, right? So all these things I, I am inspired by because it's like, I don't need to write a book. I do not need to. If I want to, I will, but I don't need to validate who I am as a professor by, by writing journal articles that nobody's gonna freaking read you know like it's just like two people are gonna read and go hmm, I'm quite so like it's 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 okay you know like when I when I can create an experience and you will remember the experience right and then you will feel like I want to I want to create something like this right I don't think you're gonna feel the same way if you read it from a journal article right so like I just say you know what I'm going to like do what I can with what I have. And what you saw there was like totally like low budget. You know what I mean? Like it was just kind of like, that was totally rascuache. And I don't know if you're familiar with the term rascuache, but it's basically, um, you know, have you ever seen people who use like toilets for, for plants, planters, or they have like bathtubs and then they put like the Virgin of Guadalupe inside and that becomes the nicho, la niche, you know, like for the Virgin of Guadalupe. And then they paint it with some leftover paint that they painted the garage with. Like, it's just like you make ends meet with what you have. Or when you go and you open a, a, a tub of butter and it's beans or salsa, right? That's all rascuache. It's like, it's survivalist. It's like we, we help the environment. We recycle. You know what I mean? But it's also like putting into work all these leftovers that you have because there's no money. You can't just go and buy new stuff. You know what I mean? You have to do what you can with what you have. And this is where you get this type of aesthetic, this like, fuck you aesthetic. You know what I mean? It's kind of like, I do what I want. Uh, it's what I have. What do you want me to do? And then you have to use your brain, right? Uh, you're forced to use your brain like a puzzle. And then to put these things together in a way that will have impact and it makes sense to you, you know? For me also, I'm very inspired by loss you know so when i have like loss or i'm being uh i'm experiencing violence i am very this is like setting me on fire you know what i mean like i'm being set on fire and then i start creating stuff i start painting i start drawing you know this uh vr experience uh, actually started with a drawing um it was a 2d painting little drawing i made in my little my book you know and it was a maguey going like, like this in, um, in a, well, a spiral, right? And uh, I thought about how, you know, we self-medicate or we have the need to self-medicate from all the suffering, but then this made me think, who am I? And then I started thinking about all the women who have been losing their children at the border, right? And then I started thinking of all the deaths and I, I started thinking about La Llorona and Malinche. I don't know, like you just start thinking memories come to your head and when you start thinking who am i right 
And then you think, but these experiences are parallel. They're parallel and they mean something. And they're usually always silent. Nobody ever listens or hears them. You know, maybe your friends, but usually it's not a public thing. It's kind of like you, you suffer in silence. So, you know, that's, um, and I feel that that need is more, it's, it's greater than the fear of what others are going to think. Like my need to express that and to say, hey, you know what, I'm here, I exist, you know, these experiences are real. That is greater than insecurity that I could have, you know what I mean? That maybe it's not like what is expected, you know? I'm, I'm going to tell you the truth, like uh, in my file, because I, I am associate professor, like, and I just recently got it. So that's why you have the old, my old bio as assistant, but like, I have nine production exhibitions, like the ones that I expressed, like I shared, I shared with you two and then this one, that one person decided they did not count for my tenure file. Like he just didn't even look at them, did not even acknowledge them at all. This one included. See what I mean? Yes. So this is the, the type of thing that I do also on purpose to expose people, right? <laughs> Because it also works to expose people because you go, look, why are you saying this is worthless? Check it out. Like you, you are not understanding the, 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 the school of thought or the, the theory behind this creation. And you're judging it as non-existent. You're just basically saying it doesn't exist. And this, then I write a letter to the provost. I write a letter and then I, I expose these things and they come out in the light. And then the next person that comes with this kind of work is not questioned like this anymore, right? So you start opening doors for other people. So there's several um, dimensions to working this way, you know, that I recommend that you um, look into for yourselves. I'm actually having to jump in here, Julia, and everyone else on the call. I'm, I oh, please like do. I'm going to be the bad guy um, because we're hitting <laughs> that time. But I mean, one has to. I know, right? <laughs> and it's, I mean, it's so inspiring and in inspiring. And I think of the kind of courses that the, the MDM students take in building virtual worlds and visual story. And, and, and Valentina, your comment about like the visual sort of essay in that format. I mean, it was, it was so inspiring to experience even in that 2D plane. Is there a way like beyond YouTube video VR to experience it or is it um, if, in VR in a fully immersive experience? Yeah. So look, it's not the same, but if you have, uh, you know, those little cartons, there's yeah, little cardboard. cartons that you can put, the cardboard that you put on yeah. your phone, you could mm. use that and it feel, you could feel like you're in there because when you move like this, it's all oh, there. Um, can we share the link I sent? Let me see if I, I still have it in mind. Yeah. We've Josh, got it. We'll we make have a it. Point of sharing that um, with everyone yeah. after the fact as well. Please share. Yeah, please share the link uh, because that way you guys can go back and explore, stop the video, yeah. you know, look at stuff closer. Um, that's, and then we're all going to start. We're all going to start our own rasquache. VR creations. <laughs> that was the funny thing when you're talking about the containers in the fridge, that has happened to me so often. I've opened it up and like, what? That's not butter. What? You know? <laughs> yeah. My is, it's a mystery box in there. You know it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah but All right. In, in, yeah. I know everyone, cool. Like, I kind of promised faculty we'd be done around this time because yeah. students who have class at seven. Uh, I'm gonna both give you the actual clap, but a virtual one here too. I know some people are off camera, but we so appreciate. The time today. Thank you. The, Thank you, everyone, yes. for your beautiful comments, your feedback. I really appreciate it from the bottom of my heart. Thank you so much, and I I hope that we meet someday. Mm -hmm. Let's stay in touch yes. for sure. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you take I care. Me speechless, which doesn't happen very often. <laughs> <laughs> wow, Dave, you were quiet the whole time. How did you do it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I, I have so many questions too and things, but I know hopefully we can get you back another time. Yeah, here's the thing. So Liliana, we do, we do these kind of exhibits and experiences in Vancouver all the time. Hopefully when we get post pandemic, you know, we'll have to see about getting you by because uh, yeah, it was so inspiring. We thank you so much. I would uh, love to. Thank you so much. It'd be an honor. Right. You, you guys take care and have a nice take care. evening. Take care. Thank you. Bye everyone.